Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. Uh, this is done in conjunction with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Uh, tonight we have a special night. It's in the imposter, imposter, imposter syndrome <laughs> um, and uh, with uh, an improv with my friend Micah Mori and Becky Love. And they will start off by doing a podcast together and then we'll have a Q and A, and then we'll actually have to turn the camera off and have some fun exercises at following that, uh, where we'll do actually some improv exercises with Mike. So uh, I will start the. I'll get us started with the spotlight for Becky and Mike. And Becky and Mike. Uh, feel free to get started. All right. Thank you very much, Joe. And welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming out tonight. Um, Becky and I figure it'll only take us about 30 minutes to cover everything there is to know about the imposter syndrome. That's going to be real easy. Uh, yeah, it's 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 such an easy topic. Uh, it, it turns out that it it's incredibly broad. Uh, but what's happened here in the past that's worked really well is that we kind of have a sort of back and forth, almost like you'd see on a podcast. And we're going to touch on some things that are related, obviously, to the imposter syndrome, but it's most likely going to start to branch off. And what we're hoping will happen is that we'll give you all our own definition of what it is. We'll share with you some of our own experiences with it. And then we're really hoping that when we're done, that the conversation really opens up and that you start giving us some feedback and your own opinions, et cetera. When we're done with that Q&A and takeaway, that's when the cameras go off. And if you're still here or if I haven't put you to sleep, uh, you can join me for some improv exercises that are done in real classes. They're a lot of fun zero pressure. So uh, hopefully you can find your way all the way through that. Grandmaster Becky, how are you? I am good. I yeah. have a little bit of jet lag, but pretty Yeah, good. you were you were in uh, South Africa. Yes, I was. Yeah, yeah. What's the time difference? Seven hours. Seven hours. All right. So uh, yeah, yeah. Well, that's, that's a bit of a jolt. So I, I don't know about you, but when, when I looked into this, you know, I, I was on YouTube and I found that one video that I posted for everybody, which I really liked. And we can talk about that a little bit later. But in terms of defining this, I started to run into some issues. You know, I didn't want to look at the definition you might find on Wikipedia or in a dictionary. Where, where did you where did you start off if you had to define this imposter syndrome? I started off with my own experience and how I interpret the imposter syndrome. And then maybe from there, uh, looked at exceptions to what I've already thought and started testing out my definition to see if it really held up and then making modifications, so. Yeah, and, and where, did, where did you start off with? Because I, I ran into a problem. I, I found there was something of an overlap, you know, when I was talking about the imposter syndrome and, and, and some of the traits that come along with it. I, I said, well, I kind of find this in other areas too. Did you, did you find something similar? Yeah, I, I started off with my own experience as well. So, um, so it's like, well, what, what are the situations where I feel like I'm an imposter. And what are the common characteristics in those situations? And that's where I started pulling my definition as a, a baseline and then modifying it as I went along, adding more situations. Right, so, right. Uh, do, would you like to start with? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 yeah, for me, it was, um, I, I found it kind of running parallel to performance anxiety a little bit. I, I thought there was a lot of similarity there, but I liked what Betty Lou Solomon said in that video. And she had her big four traits that were attached to the imposter syndrome. And they were uh, anxiety, perfectionism, self-doubt, and fear of failure, which I kind of all agreed with. But my personal definition is more taking 
those traits and kind of siloing them and making it in an area where I'm supposed to have expertise. Like I can feel anxiety in a number of different places and ways, correct? But if I feel it in my profession, you know, currently I'm a chess teacher. I've been doing this for a very long time, but there are a lot of times where I feel that self-doubt or it's it's going to be this lecture when they find out that I'm a fraud. You know, so for me, imposter syndrome is when you narrow the definition or the characteristics to your place of expertise or employment. Is that Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, I've, I think my definition aligns closer to yours than to hers. Um, mm -hmm. Though, I mean, she, the four that you mentioned um, was anxiety, self-doubt, perfectionism, and fear of failure. Fear of failure. Um, so, so that that's interesting because these are almost to me. I would see these as results of the imposter syndrome. How I to find the imposter sy syndrome was a negative mismatch of personal expectations um, with what you think other people should um, think you should be um, performing at or or being. So it, it's it's a disconnect between what you think you're where you think you're at versus what other people think you should be at. Mm -hmm. And that's different from reality because you can think you're here, but reality is you are there, but you don't, you don't see that. You think you're here and you think people expect you to actually be here. So that, that, that's funny. I wonder if there's a reversal to that. You know, somebody who has a really, uh, the ego has just exploded. I wonder if they have like a reverse gap. They think they're constantly here, and it's the other people are looking at that and going, "Oh my goodness!" You know, yes. th th there could be the, a mirror image to the imposter syndrome. The, the you know? overconfidence syndrome. Yes, yes. It's like <laughs> if the ego, if the if the big ego gets a hold of that imposter syndrome, it might actually flip that. You know, I, but I, I I would say so because yeah, because how I said it was the negative. Yeah, well, the opposite is overconfidence. You you're, right. you're here and you're not. You're, yeah, the reality says there. otherwise. Yes, right. That's right. funny. So, so I like to always say like um, confidence before confidence. So. Right, right. And and did you also find because I did, and I'm hoping some of the audience members did too that I was finding something positive about this phenomenon at some point too. In that, um, can I use it to my benefit? Because maybe there's some there's some benefit to having perfectionism controlled in your life, because at least you're aiming in the right direction, right? You don't want to aim 180 degrees up. That's pure perfection. That's that's not going to happen. But perhaps having something of a desire to be perfect, at least you're pointing in the right direction. Or if, uh, if you have a bit of anxiety before doing something, maybe that's a calling card to keep you in check, to make sure that you show up prepared, you know? So maybe there's a balance here at some point that you can strike where um, the imposter is, is just in the room with you, reminding you that you, you need to follow through what it is that you're there to do, as opposed to letting it control you to where whatever it is that you do, it's not going to be enough, which I think we're going to hear from people tonight that they experience something like that. You know, it's like they, they, perform well or they do things nine times in a row and then the 10th time they have a slight flaw and that little flaw or hiccup creates more anxiety than the nine successes created in terms of joy or fulfillment you know I, I think that happens sometimes too so you know maybe we can th there could be some benefit from that but I want to explore a little bit more our own personal uh, uh, dances that we've had with this. I dug up today my trusty, uh, my badge from, this is when I worked on the floor of the American Stock Exchange in the 80s. I'm going back a bit. And 374 was the clearing number for Janie Montgomery Scott. All my Philadelphia friends here today 
Uh, the firm was based in Philly, and I was working on the floor of the American Stock Exchange. And to get one of these, you had to become a member of the exchange. Um, so this was Janie Montgomery's badge, but I got to wear it on the floor. But the first several years of my career, I didn't get to the floor. I was a clerk, which is actually a harder job. You can imagine just being on a phone and sometimes a phone bank where you have your head like this and then you have a phone here. So you've got two people that you're trying to you know, keep happy. And at the same time, you're reading a hand signal from a floor broker, somebody who's wearing one of these on the floor. It was, I found it to be much, much more difficult. But once you got the badge, that's where the prestige came in. When you showed up at the American Exchange, they had a members only lounge where you went in, you took off your jacket, you put on the floor jacket, you put you, your badge would be pinned to it. They had somebody down there taking care of your shoes or any other items. There was a restaurant at the bottom that was only for floor members. So I guess I can say I earned my way onto the floor because I eventually got the badge, but I have to be completely honest. The second I put this on and I stepped on the floor, I said, it is only a matter of time before this whole charade comes crashing down on me. You know, have, have you had anything similar to you? I mean, things eventually worked out, but I can, I can feel this as I'm telling the story to everyone today, as if it happened yesterday. It's like, I'm looking around, you know, when somebody would make a trade with me and I realized they're actually trading with this badge which is pretty cool, right? Because this was the only thing that solidified that trade. It was my word. And it was the fact that I earned the right to wear this badge. So they're trusting me that when I trade with you, that trade will be honored the next day. None of that mattered to me. The first, I don't know, several weeks that this was on, I felt like a complete fraud, you know? Anything I like anxiety that? anxiety hearing you. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But why is that? You know, like, where does that come from? I wouldn't have gotten the seat unless I earned it. Right. Uh, I mean, it wasn't like a matter of there was nobody else to do the job. I, I kind of earned it, but I did not. I did not feel like a floor broker. I, I just kept looking over my shoulder. And I, I don't know the roots of that. You know, as I mentioned in the write up, we might have a chat about what what are some of the root causes of that feeling, you know? Yeah, I, I think that what you were describing was a lot of um, faking until you make it. Mm. So mm -hmm. maybe initially you felt like you didn't belong, but as you um, continued on, you were... Um, choosing to take your anxiety and your perfectionism but not letting it stop you because the, you can definitely be be hindered by them um if you choose the safe route of not doing anything about it but you had mentioned that using these things to prepare you and push you forward you were actually faking it until you made it and so, hence you got your badge, but perhaps your framework and understanding of you've earned it hasn't caught up with the fact that you, you've earned it. Yeah, yeah. But it, there's a pushback there, you know, because I see the path, uh, you know, as I got used to working in the booth, I saw the path to making it to the floor that those steps were pretty clear to me what they weren't easy steps but they were very clear and I said oh if I just do this this and this I'm probably going to be on the right path and I did that but still even though that was very clear once I actually got there it's almost like all the work that I put in to get there just disappeared because those stepping stones should be solid you know because because I failed a number of times along the way so to get there, you really should feel like there's a strong foundation under your feet. But I didn't feel that at the beginning. It was the complete opposite. It almost just completely disappeared. And I, I still experience this teaching. So you can all see the, the chessboard behind my head. I've, I've had one of those. I've been standing in front of one of those for over 30 years now. And there are still times when I 
of giving a lecture, and, and these are mostly kids that I'm teaching, young kids. You know, today I was teaching a first and second grade class, but there are still times when I'm giving a lecture. If there are adults in the room, I have to sometimes present in front of parents or say a school board where I have to fight the voice in my head sometimes that says, uh, this is going to be the time when you really F this up. And it's funny that Betty Lou in that video uh, quoted Maya Angelou, who said, I think she wrote 11 books at the time that video was made. And she said, even Maya Angelou said, this is going to be the book when everybody realizes I've been faking it the whole time. And uh, it also makes me think of um, basketball player Bill Russell, and uh, who, as far as I know, Hall of Fame, Hall of Fame, I think died last July. One of the best basketball players, uh, winning percentage. I mean, just phenomenal basketball player. As far as I know, he had to throw up before almost every game. Now, I'm not sure. That's that's again where that cross current comes in. Is that performance anxiety? I have heard that he was so amped up that it was his body's way of releasing tension. Like I can't imagine somebody that good is nervous before the game, or is that is he battling a similar ghost? You know, why would Maya Angelou producing poet author? She's got this great body of work. Why would she feel that way? That's a question that bothered me when I read that. You know? Yeah, for sure. I, yeah. I think it, it it goes back to that mismatch. And, and it's often internal, right? Because it's like, it's what we think, it's what we feel. Well, it's what we think that probably causes how we feel um and that is not reality um and so yeah it, it does come back to that mismatch and so how so what are some ways to i guess hack our way through this yeah to combat? yeah that absolutely Be before we get to the combating side of this um so you're a mathematician and yeah, it's funny. Look at the face you just made when I said, <laughs> so why did, why did you Let's make that not face? not exaggerate. <laughs> no, you see, you see, they're, they're, that's the same pushback that she talked about in the video. You're a mathematician. And, and you also had to teach, uh, you were a teacher's TA or you were teaching undergrad mathematics, yeah. right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you feel any of that when the first day you stepped into the classroom? Like, what the hell am I doing here? Like, I don't deserve this. Did you have any of that? I had performance anxiety for sure, uh, stage fright. Um, and so maybe this is a good time to to talk a little bit about the difference because yeah. I think there is a lot of overlap between the imposter syndrome and performance anxiety, but I wouldn't necessarily say they're the same. Um, so the imposter syndrome is I am an imposter. So it's a state of like my identity. It's a state of being. Um, whereas performance anxiety is uh, is external. It's, it's what I do. It's the outcome. But if I am, uh, if, if I tie my identity with my performance, then they're one and the same. So I think in that situation, um, the imposter syndrome is probably is the same as that kind of performance mm -hmm. anxiety. Mm -hmm. But if my performance anxiety is strictly because um, it is, is removed from who I am, it's rather um, here, here's, uh, here's a high standard. I really want it to come out well for other people. And it's outside of me, maybe there are other reasons you want it to come out really well. Um, maybe at the end of the performance, uh, there's a contract waiting for you. So of course you'll have anxiety, but it's not the same thing as, um, as right. imposter syndrome. So I think it really has to relate with, um, with, with the identity. And so, so that, that might be the, the difference between the two. So going back to me teaching um and and why i don't like to call myself 
a mathematician. <laughs> it's because it is it, it, it is an, a form of yeah. identity, right? It's like, okay, yes. today I do yes. math. I'm yes. okay with yes. saying I do it, math. It, it, you're wearing one of these now. Yeah. 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 Uh, I'm I'm wearing something or I can do something, but yes. I don't want to say I am um, because now I feel like an imposter. And right. and and it's true because I think the tendency is to constantly compare. Well, there's someone better out there. There are many people better out there. There are too many to count out there. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Um, with my limited amount of um, math. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> And is so, it it's so funny though that that yeah i've done the same thing where people say well you you're this you know in the chess world and my first reaction sometimes is to pull back and go yeah but you know that's the complete opposite of improv it's supposed to be yes and but i very often i've caught myself and i i say ah no you know so it's funny when i said that you actually pulled back when when i said you're a mathematician and it, it's funny because once you say that and you've earned it Right. You've earned it. And, and you, uh, you know, you have the capability. But the minute the words come out of our mouth sometimes, and I do hope there are other people who can relate to this here tonight, that it's so funny once that title is given to us or somebody at least puts you in that light, how it can change the way uh, we feel. I felt that here, oddly enough, uh, and I deflected. I'll use the word deflected uh, in a similar way when I did the first meetup with Shrikant on the uh, the book, The Art of Learning by Josh Waitzkin, uh, which is a fascinating book. And Waitzkin was a, became a world champion in push hands Tai Chi, and he was an international master in chess. So those are two extremely high levels of achievement in those two areas. And Shrikant wanted me to do the book with him because I was studying martial arts prior to that. And I'm a chess player as well as a chess teacher. But my levels were are lower than Josh Waitzkin. And, it, and as soon as we started introducing the book to the audience, and it was very important that the audience knew what Waitzkin did. So he, he played chess at an incredibly high level, but he played it very young. And he had a whole bunch of issues with him, his psychology, a, a lot of things that at one point made him lose his love for chess. But his method of learning was terrific. And that's what his, his book is about. And he was able to transfer that into Tai Chi, to push hands, competitive Tai Chi, to the point where I think he was 28. Uh, I think he went from zero at 20 to 28, having a world championship. What I did immediately, like the first thing that I said to the audience in the meetup, was that I am a watered down mini version of Josh Waitzkin. I immediately took whatever achievement I had. So I have a black belt in Taekwondo. That's not a world championship in um, Push Hands Tai Chi. But I got the black belt at 50, at 50. So for me personally, it was a monumental achievement. But it was so funny that when I'm talking to the audience, I'm doing it in the light of the book. So I immediately degraded what it was that I did. I play chess at the expert level, which is two big steps below weight skin, but it's still a high enough level to be proud. Of, and I am proud of it, but it's interesting that I did the same thing in that conversation, that it was immediately, let me separate myself from weight skin. He's world famous for what he's done. So why is it that I felt I couldn't elevate us both? Like my first approach was to do this to myself. It's like, well, oh, you're not a you're not a martial artist, you know. Ah, you a big deal black belt, you know. Oh, you're not a chess player expert. There's you know several thousand experts in the in the country, so do you know what I mean? So that that was that was that was very similar. So let's hack this a little bit. Let let's let's throw a few darts at this together, and then then we'll get the audience involved to see if we can, uh, you know, if we can get to the bottom of this. So anything off the top of your head that, that you've done in the past to help out? Well, we talked about, um, about, about progress. So I think if we view this more as a progress, um, 
rather than like an achievement, mm. we would feel less inclined to say I'm an imposter because the imposter is like, oh, I supposedly arrived. But if you're always arriving and you're in the process of arriving, um, then you can't necessarily fail. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Um, yeah. Uh, well, uh, unless you uh, turn, make a U turn. <laughs> Co correct. I, I found one to be uh, when I was thinking about that is, uh, and I think she also mentions this in the book, uh, I, in the video. What I like what she did is she gave a name to the voice in her head. I think she called it Miss Vader. And in, in, uh, instead of Darth Vader, it was Miss um, Vader. And her radical hero was the other voice. And I think it was her own name, Betty Lou, that kind of talked common sense to her. Um, but she did say in the video that it really doesn't go away. And I think that's part of the hack, that you, you should understand that you're going to have, uh, it may change faces, it may change forms at some point, but I don't think it ever just goes away. Um, I've dealt with feelings like this my entire life, and I'm still able to function. But sometimes I'm relieved when I hear other people say that. And she does say that in the video, that it was something that uh, that doesn't go away. So you have to learn how to work with it. And maybe, maybe to some extent, we can go back to what we said earlier about using it as a, a mirror image of itself. Instead of being so have feeling so much angst with it, is it possible to play with it a bit, to examine those those four, you know, the anxiety, the perfectionism, self-doubt, et cetera, and say, can I pull something positive from this? Okay, so being a pure perfectionist in, in a certain art form is a recipe for disaster. You know you're not going to achieve perfection all the time. So how do we make that positive? You know, is, is there a way to have a healthy run at perfection? you know, turn the, turn that mirror around a little bit. Yeah, I, I think it, it's, it's, it's about making the progress. I think perfection, if it locks you in, um, then you're too rigid. It, and it goes back to what we spoke about last um, meetup for, for improv. If you're too structured, you can't move forward. But if you're, yes. if you're allowing yourself to be guided uh, but, but, but having that flexibility to, to also forgive yourself, you know, you're, you're, you're going to make mistakes and that's human that allows you to, uh, have, take, take courage to move forward. Um, I liked what you said about taking on different personas because with improv, when, when you take on different personas, then when uh, you're being silly well you're, you're that's not necessarily you so it unlocks you it frees you up and with the imposter syndrome it's like oh I'm not being an imposter I'm already pretending so it's the person pretending that is now the imposter and and <laughs> and so you're like you know you're removing yourself um from from all those feelings that are associated with not being good enough Yes. And uh, and I think that that's a really good hack, too. It is. It is. You know, doing improv in general, uh, I, I guess actors would say the same thing. You um, you you want to strive toward that a word that we've used at so many meetups here at 52 Living Ideas, that state of flow. Right. That that is that is the goal of so many uh endeavors that you're doing something that you love. You're not counting. It's not a zero sum game. It's not a win or a loss. You're in flow. I, I feel that way now. I'll be honest again. Like I had the same feeling talking with you last time. Like I don't feel like I'm I'm presenting in front of a live audience somewhere. I feel like I'm just having a conversation. But I think uh, I, this is part of the hack that to achieve flow in general, I think you have to pay a little bit for that. You have to pay a price. And that price is the initial discomfort that comes with getting on the stage. Now, then that it can be a it doesn't have to be a literal stage, but if you are willing to 
search out where it's possible to do something with flow. You and I have talked a great deal about music, being a musician. If you can put yourself in the situation where you can play music with other musicians, I'm not talking about becoming a pro or playing in an orchestra or at the Met. I'm, I'm talking about just playing the instrument well enough that you can perform with other people. That's it. Isn't there going to be a certain amount of discomfort there initially? Yes, there's going to be discomfort practicing, learning to play. That's physical discomfort. There's going to be anguish. It's like, oh, I can't do this. Then eventually when you get good enough at your craft and you do it with other people, now you have, you might feel a bit of performance anxiety. You might feel a bit of, um, oh, I don't want to mess up here because you were a drummer. You're a drummer. So as a drummer, you, you have to keep really good control of your, your nerves, et cetera, because you are, you are literally the heartbeat of the band, right? But my point in all this is if you're willing to put yourself through that initial discomfort, then that almost becomes normal. To me, that's the ticket into where flow is. You're not always going to be there, but I think you have to experience that initial, you know, you got to get a little mud on your shoes and be slowed down a bit and feel a little pushback. But once you get through, that's where flow is. You know, you can take a drug. I mean, I can take a handful of mushrooms and I'm going to stand next and boy, am I going to be in flow. <laughs> but I don't think that's the right recipe. You know, yeah. maybe that's a hack, you know, search for flow. Yeah. The um, Well, the way I see flow is that um, it, it's like this, this boundary where if it's too easy, you, you haven't hit flow. But if it's too hard, that anxiety is um, too intense that you can't get into um, this locked in concentration where everything melts away. And, and that's the area where um, the imposter syndrome tends to play. Mm. So when you're here, you know, you, 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 you would have to really find your way to lower that anxiety. Um, in order to to come down to that state and i think possibly with overconfidence uh, overconfidence it's all the way down here where everything just is perceived as very simple yeah. and uh, yeah that that's a, that's a very good one because in the future I, i'd like to do a meetup on what they call deep practice and that that's the the band that you just described that you're you're practicing with real intent but you're doing it in that band of uh, just the right amount of challenge and just the right amount of, of, of anxiety, good anxiety. In other words, you need to be amped up in this band, but you're not you're not reaching way over your head. Yeah, that that's an excellent point. Um, one other hack that I thought of is that always know who's on the receiving end of your work, because what are they getting from your work? Because while you're today, again, I was standing in front of a group of first and second graders. Uh, it's a difficult group. There's a lot of kids. There's a, there's a few kids there with, with some behavioral issues. And uh, so for me as a teacher, it's difficult to do. But at the end of the day, if you look at what did the audience get from me? So instead of being so hard on myself, maybe I should look and say, well, what did the audience take away from what I gave them today? So I left that class a little down because I thought I missed the mark a couple in a couple of places in terms of managing the class and the way I delivered the material, but I probably should give myself a break and say, overall, there were there were 17 kids in that class. What did they walk away with? You know, so when you were teaching mathematics, for example, um, as a mathematician, uh, what did what did your students walk away with at the end? You know, I'm sure it was a, on, a, on the positive side. Yeah, I, I that's a great point because. Um... The, the imposter syndrome is is like um, you looking too much into yourself, but when you make your students or the others the center of your attention, that takes away from the pressure. And so that I think that's a another great hack. Uh, so that that's what I used to do when I taught because once I got up in front of the room, my voice would crack. And I I would get all nervous, but when the math started happening, mm -hmm. um, my <clears throat> mind went to the math. Now I'm engaging with the students, and none of that uh, was 
yeah. um, it was obvious that I was nervous anymore um, because I stopped look, looking inward. Yes. So that's a really good one. That's um, so funny. And, and how about, how about, uh, cause you and I have had this happen to us a few times where, and, and with Joe as well, that if one of us says something that we find funny, you know, really humorous. And I, and I liked Betty Lou Solomon. She, she was very good at that. She was funny. She kind of had this dry humor, you know, she's like a little slow. She was funny. And then she get very serious. I find that to be a good, like the prelude to any hack that if you, if you get somebody to legit, really genuinely smile and laugh that the body tends to loosen. And then all of a sudden things kind of, you know, go a little smoother. Yeah. I, you know, I think, I think that works too, because, um, I mean, it, the, the anxiety might start in the brain uh, and, and this is just my conjecture. Um, it, it starts with this belief and it manifests in, in your behavior, your, um, your words, but you, you can reverse it by physically changing, um, that feedback so that your brain picks up something else and it's like, okay. And it snaps it out of that, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, anxiety. But the other thing that, um, that could help with, with minimizing that, that mismatch in expectation is maybe measuring, um, ob like taking objective measurements of what your, what you claim you're not good at. Uh, and, and therefore it's like, well, either you are terrible at measuring things or <laughs> your mind is lying to you. <laughs> yeah. And so it's like, you know, how do you get yourself to believe in reality? Um, that's a really good way of doing it, but, but it can't just be like one or two times because um, you know, the, data points can be like, um, your, your outlier. It's like, oh, I just had a good day, one good day. But if you had one good day every single day, it's like, you can't really argue with that. So I think consistency, um, mm -hmm. is also a, a good way of measuring, uh, like, like, um, making yourself believe that you're not an imposter. If you yes. are consistently performing and you can objectively measure it, then it will, um, you have to give up your false belief um, that you're an imposter. Ah, oh, very good. Yeah, wow, very good. All right, um, I'll, I'll finish with, uh, we can wrap up soon and get everybody else involved. Um, so one of the questions I asked in the uh, the introduction was whether or not an art form like improvisation, comedic improv, like you take an improv class and the overall goal is for you to uh, make people laugh, let's say. Is that a legitimate hack or is that a legitimate way to combat this? And I personally find that it is in that, and I'm going back to something you said before, it's about how you can take your personality and you can put it out there somewhere and test it and run it out somewhere. And the consequences, once you get past the point where you realize nothing's going to happen to you, you're not performing live on stage, you're not getting paid to do this, there's nobody watching other than your classmates. If you can get yourself that far, then I think you get the opportunity to take whatever it is you want to change about your personality and give it a test run because there are no consequences really, right? There's no, there's, once you learn some very basic ideas of improvisation, I, I want to agree with you. And even prior to that, I just want to have fun with you. I want to play. You hear a lot of the great improv teachers say, I, I want to see you two on stage play, because if you're having fun, we're having fun. I can't tell you how many teachers have said that to me. It's because, because when you try to get good at improvisation, then fear, you have to, you have to keep doing this to the idea of fear, because that, that's what tightens you up. But all the good teachers, they all say it. I, I know, I'm curious to see what Maxime would say from the acting perspective, but I, I know the improvisers, all the great teachers say, if we're watching you have fun, then we're having fun. So I think improvisation is the type of activity that gives you a chance to take the, the personality that you might want to have or correct or kind of fix a little bit 
and give it a test run. And if it works, take it out again for a run. So anyway, I, I've, uh, as always, thoroughly enjoyed this conversation. Um, you have any concluding thoughts so we can have our friends join us? Uh, yeah, just uh, one concluding thought. Sure. Um, it, if, we, if we put the, the imposter onto our uh, improv persona, they could take on the stress for us and ah. they, can, they can fake it until you make it. There you go. Very um, good. And, and, um, and, and even if you're already there and you haven't really, you don't need to fake anything. Um, it will, uh, free you from, from the anxiety. So. Yeah. Very good. So they, that, that new personality can do the failing. So we don't have to, Oh, excellent. You should write a book. Awesome, Becky. So, Joe, I I, uh, I don't know. Maybe I could ask the crowd the first question, or unless you're very good at. Can you think of a good opening question or just general comments from the audience that uh, typing exclamation would get them involved in this conversation? Yeah, I you know I think a good question to start with is you know something. How does your environment create? imposter imposter syndrome in the sense that you know uh you know it could be the environment you grow up in uh it could be the societal the you know the school structure that you were in i mean there's a lot of things that can actually create imposter syndrome that uh you know where you kind of lose confidence along the way and then all of a sudden you know you feel like an imposter but you really don't know what your your capabilities and i think that that's one of the more interesting parts about imposter syndrome because i think that our environments help shape us right so yeah are you an imposter or not and then that, i think that could be a good question to get us started and then everyone else uh go ahead let me uh i'm going to remove the spotlight first actually since uh becky you already removed the spotlight um and so everyone up uh, now that we'll go to the Q&A portion of the uh, program, just go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat. Uh, and if you have any questions or comments about Becky and Mike's dialogue, uh, we'd love to hear them. Uh, after that, we'll go to uh, some improv, uh, practice some improv uh, as off camera, but uh, improv exercises with Mike who, is uh, an expert in improv. So we'll go from there. <laughs> go ahead, Evanique. Um, first of all, thank you, Mike and Becky. That was a great conversation. Um, I think some of the takeaways that I took from it is um, when Becky was first talk talking about your identity and then taking out your identity, um, when talking about imposter syndrome, because you link it to your identity, I think it's true. You know, like even though you're you're thinking you can't do this, but you have that anxiety because if you can't do it, you you link it to who you are, and then you think, oh my gosh, I've told people I'm this and I'm not, but I'm supposed to be this. It ties into the question about environment. It's kind of like when you interview for a job, right? For instance, you interview for a job, you tell these people all these great things about yourself and you try to make it, you try to paint the best picture of yourself. But now you have to live up to that image that you put out there of who you are. So now you got to come into this job and, and live up to the image that you said you were in the interview. And that's imposter syndrome. And how do you combat that? You don't connect it to your identity. You just say, I'm going to do the best that I can. And, you know, um, and then back, what, a point that Becky made towards the end when she said, you know, you let your identity take on um, the nerves first. Like you, you, put your, I, you put your imposter out there first, that same person kind of that you put in your interview, and then you let yourself catch up. So I, I think I love that part. Um, Mike, when you were talking about the art of learning and then you you were said you were immediately saying yes, but I'm not as great as this guy. And I was thinking you were comparing yourself to this guy, which the comparison, no one wins, 
I think, because you have different life experiences than the author of that book, which I'm sure is great, but two things can be true at the same time. You are great and he is great. And you're a great teacher and a great chess player. And so is he. And you're a black belt. And I, I don't know if he was a black belt or not, but the point is, is that you, you guys have different experiences. You both are great. It's, it's no comparison because you don't need to. Um, and, and I have to take that on too, because I think that comes with uh, imposter syndrome is the comparison to somebody that you think is great. And um, so I, I, I like that. And when you guys talked about combating, um, I, I don't, I forget which one who said it, but it was, you talked about always arriving. I think it was Becky who said, if you're always arriving, you've never really arrived. So it, 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 it combats that perfectionism, you know, that, you know, you're aiming for it, but you know, in your mind that you're never, it's, it's a goal that never ends. It's something that you're always striving to be a little bit better today than you were yesterday, or you're always, your best is always going to change once you get the experience. So you're always arriving and you're always going to that next level. So, um, I did like that. Um, and you, and you talked about having a healthy run at perfection. Um, I was thinking of the book, the next one thing, I forget the author's name, but he said, you keep going for the next one thing, the next one thing. And he was like, if you're shooting, he used the analogy of if you're shooting for the moon, even if you don't make it, you hit the stars. And, you know, he was like, even if you set this high goal for yourself, if you don't hit it, you've made it further than where you were. At least you're not where you started. So I, I, I did like that. Um, uh, I think that's all I have. Oh, uh, sorry, one more thing, actually. When you talked about always a uh, knowledge of who is the on the receiving end of your work, I always think of, I think that's a great thing to think about because then it's not perfection. It's like, who is being helped by the work that you're doing? So um, I like that. So that's it. So Mike or Becky, do you have any comments that you would like to make uh, to that? Um, yeah. And folks, yeah. go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat. Evanika, uh, are, you, are you a court reporter? <laughs> <laughs> no. Paralegal. That was, Close. <laughs> that, that, was, that was great. Yeah, that, yeah, that, was, that, was, a... that was really good. Yeah, you can type exclamation. Uh, this conversation is free flowing. If there's anything you heard or you didn't hear, especially that you want to contribute about the topic, just Put an exclamation in and and okay. Go right ahead. So you'll wait. You, you don't want to comment on anything that Evanique said. Oh, right oh, yeah. So. I I liked. Uh, well, firstly, when when she mentioned uh, comparing myself with Waitskin, um, it, it's something that um, you have to be careful that everything in your life doesn't become a zero or a one. Like you quantify everything you do. You know, it's the level of achievement in chess. This is one of the problems of playing a competitive sport. Uh, that your identity gets tied to a result because it's quantifiable, right? I can actually count how many games I win, how many games I loses, I lose, and and that counting sometimes is very very counterproductive. So I think there's nothing wrong with being a competitive chess player or doing something where there's you're trying to score points, but I think you need to balance that out with something like improv, where I'm not the opposite of trying to compete with someone. And score points. I think it takes away some of the angst of of trying to keep score. So I like that, Ebenique. I thought that was a uh, uh, catching that that comparison was spot on. I definitely felt that. I can appreciate that, and I just want to build on. I know we have uh, some people in the queue, but uh, let me just build on that really quickly. Um, are there some professions that lend themselves to imposter syndrome more? Mm -hmm in the sense that where you're counting, like you mentioned specifically something like chess, or you could even say an athlete where the wins and losses are, you know, they are what they are, you know, they, it's, there's not much debate about that. So, you know, in, in, in certain cases that you're just not going to make the cut, right. But 
in general, there could be professions themselves that lend themselves to imposter syndrome more than others, I would think. Uh, I would think something even like mathematics, to tell you the truth. Um, you know, it's an intimidating uh, um, profession. And so that a lot of people, you know, may feel like an imposter in mathematics when they're really not, you know. So do you, do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I I'd actually, I wouldn't mind asking. I have uh, two people here that I know are physicians. One is my dear friend, and I know Jason as well, is uh, also a physician, I believe an emergency room uh, physician, if I'm not mistaken. I, I'd love to, you, you don't have to answer right now, but I would love at some point to know if either one of you or if there's another physician. And Joe, this is to your point about it, is something um, specific to a certain profession. So I would imagine as you're kind of moving up or going through uh, the ranks to become a, a, a physician, do, do you ever, do either one of you ever experience any of that or had experienced that? Yeah, I mean, I think that we could follow up on that, but Gerald's been uh, waiting. Um, oh yeah, sure. So, sure. so we're going to let, let him go and then we'll hopefully uh, 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 either uh, Brad or uh, Jason will actually answer their question. Go ahead, Gerald. No, oh, you're on mute, sorry. Are you able to unmute? Okay. Uh, there we go. For, there, there we, we go. go. Sorry about that. Uh, that's all right. Thanks, Joseph. Um, yeah. Wow. I mean, uh, I I wasn't really one hundred percent certain what the topic was tonight, and the timing for this for me personally is is really good. Um, I want to start with saying I I love Becky. Your starting with the fact that you know you started with your experience. Um, it, and so I'm just a little background. I'm going to be 50 in, in next month. Um, I started uh, playing upright bass at third grade. Uh, by the time I was in high school, I was sitting second bass to my um, teacher in, a, a, in our city symphony. And um, so that was, I, I kind of look at that as almost my first career so to speak <laughs> my second career then has been architecture and uh despite the mm -hmm. fact that i have undergraduate and graduate degrees in architecture and and also um um 20 uh 25 almost 30 years of experience in the profession um with some amazing projects under my belt i only recently got licensed um, and so, and that was actually within the last, uh, uh, that was, that was November of last year. So, um, two things, one is that, um, flow when, when I was, when I was younger and, 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 um, on stage quite a bit, I mean, I, I was on stage two, three times a week, uh, whether it was a symphony, whether it was a jazz band, whether, whatever it was. Um, I actually didn't practice much outside, and this comes down to um, outside of practicing with the group, and this comes down to um, environment. I actually was in a, an environment that was not supportive of what I was doing. I was often asked not to practice at home. Um, that was very difficult. On, on the other hand, I, I also had part of the environment who was taking me to practice with, with a, 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 a teacher on a regular basis. But my point is that that created a lot of self-doubt um, over the years, despite the fact that I was excelling even at a young age. Um, and for me, it was, it was, it was play. Um, I, 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 as you were talking, one of the, one of the thoughts that came to mind that I've, uh, one of the, one of the terms that I've come come to through therapy over the years is, is this idea of pace, which is play and acceptance and curiosity and empathy. And to me, um, flow basically comes down to that, that, that getting to that level of em self empathy, where, where there's harmony, um, if, if you will. Uh, my only other thought is with architecture, um, 
when I was a young architect um, working in, in, in DC, I, I'm, I'm now in New York City, but um, I, I had this uh, architect come up behind me one day and I essentially had a stage fright. I, di I didn't know what it was, but I was sitting there and I was trying to work on this project and I just froze. And I, I don't know how long I froze for, but I, I just didn't know what the next step was. And I didn't know how to ask for help. Um, and it was really interesting. He picked up on it and he comes up behind me and I, I don't know what the dialogue was, but I remember him saying to me, Gerald, this is, architecture is just a practice. It's, it's a practice. It's, it's a, a life of practice. And I would imagine you were talking about um, your physicians. I've heard, I've heard uh, physicians talk about this too, where there's no guarantee you're not going to kill somebody in surgery. It really is just the practice. Uh, but I think that when we start to um, put too much emphasis on the outcomes rather than the process or the progress, um, we do ourselves a really big disservice. And, and, and uh, yeah, I mean, again, I mean, I've been in the business for 30 years. I, I have amazing projects. I have the badge, a couple badges <laughs> in a couple <laughs> states now, and yet, I'm still <laughs> thinking, uh, wow, they're going to find out that I, I don't know what yeah. the hell I'm doing. I'm going to lose the next client or, you know, and I take it all personally or, you know, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's sure. a big part of it is, you know, there's a, the, the four agreements. I don't know, you know, to me, it's a, a nice short book where, where one of the biggest things is, is not to take things personally so much. Um, anyway, that's, thank you. This is my first time. I really enjoyed it. And, and thank you for letting me share that. No, and thank you for your comments, uh, Becky or yeah, Becky or Mike. Do you want to make any comments, or do you have any comments? Becky, you can go first. I I have something, but uh... I just really enjoyed that sharing. So uh, very glad that you opened up to us about your background, and um, and I think a lot of us found it very relatable. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I love, Gerald, what you did for me there is, um, which is something I've experienced here at 52 Living Ideas. So welcome, by the way. I do hope you come back. They, every day of the yes. week, there's something really exciting going on here. But what you just did for me, other people have done here for me, is that I realized, like, you're a really smart guy, and you spent a lot of time doing something, and yet you're still willing to say, hey, look, <laughs> I'm really struggling with this. And when I see somebody that can share that, inside immediately with me it's like wow this is this is the kind of place that i want to be you know so i always leave these meetups saying it's time well spent so you just did that for me so thank you very much really appreciate it yep uh so next up we have uh paul in the queue paul yeah thanks these meetups are always time well spent mike it's pretty amazing isn't it it's because of the people it's because of the people Srikant and Joe and Evanique and others have attracted. So, um, uh, but on the subject, um, a couple a couple things. One is I noticed because I was curious. The term was only coined, I think, in the seventies, the right. imposter syndrome. So, my proposal based on that is, we can take a little of the weight off ourselves. I've, I've felt that I can give you lots of examples of feeling it. Mike, especially in music, especially in music. Um, and uh, my point is, it's the culture imposing it upon us. And this modern culture is creating the syndrome. That's a proposal. And if you look at uh, the ancient texts that this whole 52 living ideas just goes into all over the place. And Joe, what does Krishna say? He says, don't be attached to the fruits. What is in the Tao? Flow with the river. What is, what is, uh, what are we doing with the Christian tradition of giving, surrendering to God? If we were basing, having more of that, in the culture, I might propose, there would be no such thing as imposter syndrome, because the answers are there. 
I know I'm being kind of preachy and like, but I just wanted to get it on the table as a possibility. Well, as one who beat himself up severely for, how come I can't play piano like Oscar Peterson? I'll never be able to play piano like that, you know? And so I might as well just friggin' give up piano altogether, just screw it, you know? But what about the process? What about Ravi Shankar saying he's an advanced beginner as the most advanced sitar player in the world? Well, he's in that culture and he's not being an imposter. He doesn't care. His spiritual path of, of, of uh, sitar playing. He's an advanced beginner. Great. That's this lifetime. Okay, that's what I have to add to that. Thanks, everyone. I think you hit on a very important point there, Paul, though. It's just this idea. And, it, it, you know, even the ancient texts, uh, you know, you can go back to Stoicism as well, is this being, you know, uh, detached from the outcomes. That's essentially what you're saying, uh, is that you're not focused on the outcome, you're focused on the journey itself. Uh, and that is somewhat of a cure for imposter syndrome. But very good points, very good points. Um, Mike or Becky, do you have any comments? That was extremely encouraging and very, very uh, positive. Like that is definitely a hack we need to put on our list, Mike. Yes, indeed, <laughs> indeed. Yeah, you know, Paul. I I, uh, yeah, we should Go put ahead. it on the list. So, yeah. So, Paul, I also talk to a lot of teenagers uh, through chess, but that's just the medium. And, and what I find is um, the social media experience that they have with the number of likes and followers, et cetera. It is a constant wheel of keeping track of where their identity or where they're supposed to be is at. So I think that that's to your point as well, that the culture um, is kind of accelerating this process. You know, now it's almost, it almost feels exponential to me, you know? So it's interesting that if you're doing something outside at school, let's say you're playing in the band at school, and now when you come home as a 15 year old and you have your phone, like, the text and all the chatter that was going on in the auditorium has now followed you home. And all the people that like the conversation, follow the conversation, just keeps growing and growing and growing. And I, I wonder what it's like for them. You know, I'm not a kid. So yeah, that was a great point, Paul. Great point. Uh, uh, so Jason is in the queue, but uh, I do want to follow up something after that. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so I do want to just draw back on one of, something that Ebony said. I did post about in the chat uh, that, yeah, what is greatness, right? Um, how do we know that, uh, you know, uh, Mike is less great than Josh? I mean, you know, one, Josh Waitzkin, the author of that book, right? I mean, like I said, uh, Mike is the one giving his time to all of us tonight, you know, trying to help facilitate conversation and try to, in, in, you know, teach some of his experience and learning and wisdom to us uh, and Becky as well. So. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's, uh, we've all touched on that point, right? It's, it's the metrics of, um, and I think Becky, you mentioned this too, like, what are the, what are, what are the objective findings when we discuss things like competence and qualifications? And I think uh, it may not be objective, you know, those of us who are running this group, but at least subjectively that, uh, the idea of giving, which is, uh, again, pointing point out many ancient texts it's um it's so often forgotten by us who are judging each other based on uh these these qualifications right so i think we should all um remember that for ourselves and realize that it is a it is a just a very important criteria and it's often one that's missing in the world today where we all judge each other based on years worked or um and for those of us in academia articles published books published um things that are easy to point to certificates on the wall right but it's it's um uh it, it's those other things that are not necessarily so easy to display like yeah how many meetup groups have you hosted and and how many how many hours of your time have you given to share some of your wisdom with others and again i'm just pointing because this is all very there's a very salient uh topic for us right now but aside from that, um, I am, uh, as Mike alluded to, not an ER doc, but an urgent care doc. I actually work oh, at, mm -hmm. so those of you who, in the, who are in the Philly, so close enough, but still a few steps down from in, in terms of acuity. 
uh, or in intensity of medical situations. Um, and I work at the you know, Patient First, which is a, an urgent care in the Philly area. For those of you who are in the Philly area from here, this group, I know it's a lot of New Yorkers, but uh, if you were my patient, I will, I will slightly disagree that outcome, I mean, outcome does matter in, in my line of work, at least. Um, you know, I, we all want to do the best jobs we can for our patients. And yet sometimes it's, there's factors out of our control that are, are kind of in the way. And one of those things is, um, you know, how, how busy we are on a given day and, and even some things about the patients, if they're not perhaps sharing everything they should, or, um, I mean, there, there's, there's several things I can go on, but despite those situations, and I do, and I, by the way, I, I've been taking improv lessons for eight years. And what that's done for me is it helps me try to minimize those factors that are out of my control and stoicism, a lot of times it's a, it's all about emphasizing the things that are within your realm of control and things that are without outside your realm, realm of control. But for me, if I can help facilitate that initial relationship with the patient that I've never met before, probably never will meet ever again. If I can do that with, again, the three main prongs of improv as I've come to understood it, listening to what they were actually saying and also understanding about the, the subtext of what they're not saying, what they're implying, right? If you can be very attuned to those things that a patient's putting out there, you don't have to ask necessarily as many questions because you're, you're gathering everything from their nonverbal language as well. Um, to the best of your ability, like I said, you care, listening, caring, and reacting. So listening, caring about what they're actually saying, paying attention to the person in front of you, not you know, silencing that, that hamster on a wheel going 90 miles an hour because you're stressed, right? I'm stressed as a doctor, patient stressed as the patient, but it's that, it's that improv practice that's helped me silence that inner voice to be able to be present in the scene where I'm really just paying pretend and then reacting. It's reacting to the person in the moment and reacting to not my own inner agenda, but what the person in front of me is really putting out there. So those three things um, have really helped me with, uh, Yes, calming myself in the moment, um, controlling the factors that I can, and trying to build a quick relationship with a patient that allows them to be more honest with me. And even if, again, even if I am suboptimal in my medical care, let's say, I, I, and there's been studies about this, I can sort of keep the lawyers away, ideally, knock on wood, uh, by, yeah. by really, by, 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 focusing on the relationship and at the very, if things don't go well, ultimately, and the patient's deciding who they want to, which one of the doctors who were involved with their care from me to the ER, to the cardiologist, let's say if they have a heart attack or whatever, maybe they leave me out of the lawsuit, maybe, or maybe they put, bring me into a lawsuit. But when they, when they see me in the courtroom, like, you know what, that guy, Dr. Suit, he meant well, you know, um, so there, there's that idea. And this is only tangentially what we're talking about. And I'll just finish up with this. Um, with the imposter issue, part of, part of the issue is that we graduate from med school after four years of studying and we're just called doctor the same way. So I'm Dr. Sue, just the way Dr. Fauci is Dr. Fauci. And the same way, you know, um, all the great doctors we ever heard about are also doctor. There's no levels of doctor. It's just like, there are at least levels of, of chess. There's levels in, in martial arts. There's levels in many things, but there's not, but in the professions where there are no actual levels, it, it opens it up for, um, you know, yeah, this feeling of, it, of imposter syndrome where we, me on my first day as an intern being called doctor, that was, it shook me in a, in a way that I almost said, hey, don't call me that right now. I said that to other doctors. And some other doctors said, no, you're your doctor. You be that. And they, some doctors even said part of my issue is that I'm not embracing that title because um, I had a very tough time in my intern year. Um, and that was around the time I started improv. And I was having a really tough time in improv too at the time. And uh, I had to eventually embrace the fact that I, I still was a medical student. And guess what? I still am a medical student. Eight years after graduating med school, um, when I go to conferences, 
and I have a name tag on, everyone's putting MD or DO. I try to put, um, I, I, I do try, sometimes when I'm, feel, when I'm in the right mood for it, I put eighth year medical student on my tag underneath my name. Hmm. Because especially when I'm with other medical students, sometimes I go to conferences where there's other medical students, because I want them to realize that I'm, I'm truly never done learning and I'm, I'm willing to put that out there. Uh, even when I'm supervising other residents in the urgent care who are just training. And some of they're so poorly trained in some ways, they're not prepared for the job. And I, I want to yell at them. I want to tell them, dude, like, what are you doing here? Like, you're not ready. Like, take some time off, focus on your actual residency training. Don't, don't try to working yet. You're not ready. But I really just tell them, look, I'm, like, it's not you. It's the nature of the beast. The, the training isn't there yet. Um, you know, stick with it. Keep studying. I wasn't there when I was your age at your stage. I'm still not there. Sometimes we're on the same path. I'm trying to actively fight what is very easy for me to play into the same game. Now that I'm eight years out to say, you haven't earned what I have. You don't earn, deserve to be making the same salary that, that I'm making per hour. Um, it's very easy for me to say that I have to actually try to fight it. And so I'm glad I went through what I went through as an imposter intern year because it never left me. Like I never forget that feeling. And I don't want people to go through the negative parts of it, right? The positive part is what I learned as a lesson. And, but I don't want that, that, that negativity to seep in. So that's all I'll say for now. Thanks for giving me the chance. Mm. No, no problem. I mean, I think you made some great points. I mean, I'd actually really like to dig into this idea, though. You know, you become a doctor, right? You know, you're you're a doctor, uh, and it can be the environment, right? Sometimes there are being in the ER may be a lot more stressful, you know, than say being in in a, a private practice in that kind of you know scenario. So, I mean, you may feel like, you know, that, that you're, even though you're a good doctor, that you feel like an imposter in one particular situation and not the other. And that's where I was kind of going with environment rather than the profession itself, um, where the environment can create the idea that you're, well, am I not a good doctor? Well, that's not necessarily true. You're just maybe not in the right environment. That's what I was kind of getting at a little bit earlier. Um, maybe that's not the best example because you know that that you may actually your personality may lead you to be an imposter in the ER room. But nonetheless, uh, that's the kind of that's the uh, um, example I was kind of going at with environment a little bit earlier. So Miss Char has been waiting very patiently. So hi, good evening. Um, wonderful presentation, guys. I um, wanted to speak on kind of the experience that I've also had with uh, imposter syndrome. Um, I'm someone that has um, experienced a tremendous amount of failures uh, publicly online, romantic failures, social failures, academic failures. Um, and then at some point I decided to go back to school to change my career um, with the, the blessing of, you know, professional certification from two of the top, two of the, you know, highest esteemed institutions in the U.S. And even saying that, you know, creates anxiety for me. Um, but one of the things that I have learned is um, oftentimes what alleviates a lot of the stress for imposter syndrome, for me, is the, the willingness to say, I don't know, or, or, you know, I have no idea without there being any guilt or shame attached to that, um, because there's nothing wrong with not knowing. There's nothing wrong with me because I don't know. I just don't know. And I find that I tend to, to garner more consideration and respect um, as the person that I am and at the skill level that I am, just by saying, I don't know. So that, that has helped tremendously for me personally. And just as a side note, I spent two years working in a hospital. I have worked in an ER. Every opportunity I got as you put in a different uh, section of the hospital, ER work is really hard work. Um, so I, I hear you all the way. Um, thank you for the, the work that you do. It can be a thankless job. And no doubt it can be really, really hard. Yeah, I mean, I thank you for your comments. And I think that that's a really important point is that when you have this feeling of imposter syndrome, 
you probably don't have the confidence to say, I don't know. You know, that, that, that's probably, and, 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 you know, that's completely okay. Uh, you know, I think that, um, uh, but there, there is one question I want to bring up. I, I mean, and I, it, it comes back to this idea of environment, you know, and I, I work in an environment with a, it's, it's, um, they, where there are very few, few uh, uh, female engineers and, and they're, it's mostly male. Uh, it's in the military and they're, and they're the specific type of engineers. Um, does that create the idea of imposter syndrome? You know, that you're, you're kind of, you know, that, that you're, you're the only woman in the room, you know, that that's kind of, is it along sometimes gender lines? And this is where societal stereotypes can kind of fit in to how the narrative that we actually tell ourselves, you know, that, that, and, and that I think can lead to imposter syndrome. Do you guys have a comment on that? Well, I think um, you're, you're definitely right about that. And, and Jason had mentioned it as well. It's, it's that expectation. It's like doctor. Well, what's the expectation when you hear doctor and, um, and, and, uh, when you're the only female uh, in that room, which I, unfortunately I've had the uh, uh, the opportunity to be uh, that in many places, um, it is it's the ex expectation. Like, what is she doing there? Um, and, and so, uh, I, I would say that the imposter syndrome really has a lot to do with with other people's, ex well, your perceived um, understanding of other people's expectation and how does that impact your own expectation um, for yourself? And um, because we're not all immune to that, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I appreciate, and I thought that that would be the case too. Uh, you know, Becky, so I appreciate you sharing that. Um, uh, your experiences with that. Frederick, uh, you're up next. Okay, hi, I really enjoyed this, thank you. Um, I'd like to start with something that I thought was uh, very observant by Becky, and that is you're, you're sitting there and you feel like an imposter and you look around for some objective evidence that you're not. And I think that's a very important thing. But what I'd like to discuss is the, the, the prelude to all of that is, how did you get there? How did you get into a position where you say, am I an imposter? And I notice, at least in my town, that we're creating people in that position. So if you get a, if you get a, if you're a freshman in college and your grandfather donated the library and you got into that college because your grandfather donated the library, you're not quite sure you have the metrics that earned your way in like everybody else. We give everybody on the soccer field the trophy. We tell them how wonderful they are. And they come off the field knowing I'm slow. I've never scored a goal. And here I have this trophy. So is that kid an imposter? Did we create that imposter? What I guess I'm trying to say is, or you start a new job and your uncle happens to be the CFO of the company. And all of the people who started that private equity firm along with you have master's degrees from Stanford and Harvard and other places. And there you are with this group. So what I guess I'm getting at is that there really are imposters and we're creating a few imposters, but the people who get there, they may be smart and they may not be imposters and they need Becky's objective, um, analysis to know. I went to a, a terrible high school in Florida and then found myself at a fairly good university. And I looked around and 
I felt like an imposter. I didn't know how to write a paper. Nobody ever told me anything, even though I earned my way there. I believe me, my grandfather did not donate to the library. <laughs> but but uh, I guess what I'm saying is, are we are we uh, um, in many ways does a lack of a full meritocracy to get to positions create the imposter syndrome? Hmm. Do you, back here, Mike. Yeah, well, that yeah, that's a good yeah, one. I think that's an, I think that's, that's a, a really good one, question. Fred, because that that's uh, that's a similar line of thought that Paul took. Is there a cultural like just fertilization, or are we seeding something from the uh, from the cultural standpoint? So I see a parallel to what uh, Paul said there, Fred. Exactly. <laughs> Excuse me. Mm -hmm. Becky, do you wish to comment at all? I, I think this is a somewhat of a profound point, uh, but go ahead. Yeah, um, I, I think that there are definitely certain um, things that lend better to um, meritocracy. Um, but then, uh, and that's actually more of my uh, initial inclination to to think so too, just because I, I tend to be more analytical. But th then Jason had mentioned something, you know, the the subjective parts too. Mm -hmm. And um, when I consider Joe's question about the environment um, and what causes an, the uh, imposter syndrome or, or not causes, but like really promotes that. Um, I thought, well, perhaps it's also this wide range of not being able to define what is. And so um, there are certain kind of um, uh, 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 jobs or professions that are a combination of skills. And, and, and so especially where soft skills come in to play it's harder to define and i think that actually adds a lot to um to the possibility of having imposter syndrome because um because then like how do you say you're necessarily good at something when that range is so large and like these soft skills are not easily quantifiable um though you can still say it's qualitatively, um, you know, good or, uh, but uh, I, I think a full meritocracy may be um, too far of a push, but, um, but I, I do see your point. Um, and, and that is uh, meritocracy tends to be my uh, inclination for, for kind of Fix, fixing um, the problem of um, of the imposter syndrome. But then, you know, there are also all these other hacks that that really work well too. Yeah, I would I would just build on that. Is that you know the one thing about looking at it from a meritocracy perspective that makes the progression look linear, like it actually needs to follow this formula and life really doesn't work like that in other words you know however you get to the table you get to the table you know some people may say that person didn't earn it they didn't you know that that they're only there for x y and z reason and i think that there are you know there's different ways to be successful and so i mean that's where i think that these it becomes a little bit diff more difficult to define like objectively like, uh, uh, are you there because of merit per se? Well, you're there somehow. And, and um, now I'm not, I'm excluding the individuals that you're saying if you're, you know, uh, a donor to a university or something along those lines. But uh, I'm just saying if there's an unconventional way of being successful, uh, that, that, that may not be seen as merit-based but it really got to the same place that the other individuals have have achieved of achievement 
and it also, um, uh, I think also like what happens if you really are an imposter? And this is where, um, where faking it until you make it kind of comes in uh, to play. It's like you may not have, you, you may not have earned your seat at the table, but if if you take the opportunity that was given to you and you really make something of it, um, you're making progress to to now justify your seat at the table, then uh, in, it's it's only going to be a matter of time where where it's like, okay, now now you 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 are no longer an imposter. Yeah, and a, a lot of it is based on your beliefs. I mean, you know, do you believe? What do you really believe? You know, it's what that individual actually believes, whether or not they're, they feel like they're an imposter. You know, people may think that, oh, you're there for this reason, but what is a person then, they believe they belong there. And beliefs have a huge impact uh, on an individual's uh, ability to to um, to perform, uh, and and if you know there there have been interesting uh, even studies done with uh, with athletes in that particular area, you know, with their they they lose confidence, they've reached the highest level of their profession, but then they, they start to believe things that they they can't do certain things anymore, um, and you know it impacts their overall performance. Um, I believe there was actually, I believe Mike would know probably better than I, there was even a catcher for the Mets that couldn't throw the ball back to the pitcher at one point. I believe Mackie Sasser might have been. Um, you're muted, Mike. Yeah, I think it was. And there's also Steve Sachs, the second baseman. Couldn't throw uh, I the think ball. he even played for the Yankees. Was, was it Sachs? And Knobloch, too. No, Knobloch. Yeah. Knobloch, But anyway, too. these are, these are yeah, just Sachs, examples. The Yankees. Sachs was a Dodger. You're right. Knobloch was a Yankee. He couldn't throw the ball to first base after a while. Yeah, it just, Correct. just happened. Yeah. Yeah. I don't mean to bring <laughs> the athletic aspect of it in, yeah. but it's there's an important thing here. It's a mental block yeah. that's stopping yeah. you. And then all of a sudden, you know, that's part of it. It's your belief system that you're there. And uh, so I think that that's... Um, an imposter syndrome can go either way. That's yeah. what, if there's faking it till you make it, and then there's an imposter syndrome, and then it goes either way. Um, so, anyway, well, does it? Do you have any other comments? Um, no, you? that that was good, okay. Joe. Maybe we can have Paul in the queue. Um, yeah, speak, and then we'll we'll jump and do some exercises before we close out tonight. Sure. Yeah. That works. Actually, I didn't. I lost track of. Uh, no, I, the conversation's been great. So, am I going? Yes, you are. Okay, um, I'll be brief. This is the improv part. No, so Well, no, this is, I love these comments. And uh, I have this person who does our group supervision where I work in a therapy environment, but Frederick won't like this guy too much. I think it was Frederick because he's wonderful, but he shows this cartoon of a kid playing softball or something. And he's like, he can't hit, he misses every catch in the field, he throws completely wrong. And at the end, the dad goes, what a great job you did today. So my point is back to Joe's question. Now his point, our supervisor guy is, you make a kid feel respected and valued, but the environment of false praise what might be called false praise, the opposite of a meritocracy in a way, might lead to imposter syndrome the same way that harsh criticism of, I'm gonna spank you because you didn't catch that ball that she talks about in the TED talk a little more. They could both lead there because when you're getting nothing but false praise, and I, I feel like I personally experienced some of this in my family. My father would praise me for absolutely nothing and I completely stopped believing him, but then you can't really tell when you're succeeding. So you're always uncertain. So that's just a, a point about that. But there's a way of doing praise that is the praise for the effort that makes the kid know they still didn't catch the ball. So there's my thoughts on maybe parenting about this, but yeah. 
Yeah, I think and, and, it comes back to the accuracy of things. You know, it's like, um, well, if you're giving all this false praise, the child could ha have imposter syndrome. He could have um, uh, overconfidence. But if you're praising the effort, that's accuracy. Very Ex good. Except if that kid grows up to be a pilot and then it comes time <laughs> to land that plane, you know, like two out of three. Well, that's band. where it becomes... Yeah, well, that, that's where that's where that's where it kind of comes into. It's very quantifiable, it, very it, objective, and, and, very objective. There's no subjectivity and, in and, that. And profession based. I mean, as an architect, Gerald, I'm sure at yeah. some point you got to make sure the things that you design stand up. And Fred and 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 Jason in the medical field that that you know, you you plug all the leaks. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So, I'm pointing out though that it doesn't turn into overconfidence necessarily. It turns into feeling very insecure because you can't really tell if the praise is real or not. So you never know where you stand. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, um, so actually Jason wants to make one last comment. You know, just really quickly to your question, Paul, or point, Paul, I, I, I do want to make one point that I think is important, is that there could be a generational aspect of it as well. It can be passed down if you think about it, from the parent to the child. Um, so if you, that's something else to consider uh, when you talk about imposter syndrome. Um, well, do you want to let Jason comment really quickly? Yeah, yeah, sure, that? sure, of course. Yeah, real quick, I just want to add to that the, the question of meritocracy, I found that very interesting. And I would actually bring up a counterpoint a little bit. I mean, again, my, my first reflex is, yeah, meritocracy all the way. Like, that's, that's, that's it, man. But Let's take something like personality. Um, someone who is a very good interviewer, someone who just has practiced the art of interviewing or just has a charismatic personality but doesn't have, uh, or, or they're, they're so good in the interview that they actually potentially make up for some uh, deficiencies that may were it just to be a paper, uh, just, just a, a battle of resumes purely, maybe they would not have been selected, you know? And I think someone would say if you do well in the interview and, and you you've got a decent record then that that's a it's meritocratic for you to get the job but and i see this in in the medical field too i, I potentially saw this with myself like maybe i was such a good i was so good at the interview that the person allowing me to get into med school may have uh glossed over the fact that maybe i didn't have as much research as the next guy or same thing with residency i got into a good residency maybe because you know, I just smoothed my way through. And again, meritocratic, I qualified, but on what basis? So I'll just put that out there as a, uh, as a, as, as a question. And I'll also say that uh, with the idea of mindset, so Carol Dweck, maybe, maybe some of you have heard the book, maybe read it. Uh, she actually has data to back up um, this idea of, yeah, praising the child for their accomplishments or their, their traits, like, oh, you're so smart, you're so talented, you're, you're blank, like you are this, you are that, you are your accomplishments. Uh, the same way me, I mean, I grew up in an Indian family, like I think a lot of, I mean, this is probably cross-cultural as I think many of us have found, but I, I as the oldest child of an immigrant family, uh, everything was all about my achievements and not so much about my efforts, um, not so much about my determination or my motivation or my whatever, just it was all about the outcome. And I think that did some damage, but obviously my parents, I can't fault them. They didn't know any better. Carol Dweck's book only came out in like 2014. They couldn't have read it. So, uh, but yeah, there's, there, there is some solid research behind the idea of uh, being careful as, as to how we, how we praise children because it could end up becoming their identity and then when failure inevitably comes they get more crushed than the kid who was not praised quite so much like like potentially my siblings I think my siblings have all done well my younger siblings uh they've done well in a different way they've done well it seems like they, they have a different kind of confidence than I had that actually has suited them almost better in life or differently in life maybe because they did not get the kind of praise that I got from the kind of unqualified praise, well, not unqualified, but the kind of results-driven praise that I got from my parents. Um, 
they did not get that level of praise. So it's just, it's interesting to reflect on. That's it. Thank you, Jason. I mean, and I'll just close with this really quickly. You know, there are, we've covered Ray Dalio here in the past, and um, I really think he has one of the best kind of approach when he's in his book principles uh, about how to maybe deal with imposter syndrome is that he considers himself to be a hyper realist uh, and essentially constantly seeking the feedback from the people around him uh, to un not only for the truth about himself, but to also have an understanding of reality. And uh, so that that feedback, then he figures out, okay, and he's super transparent as well about himself being super open, which takes a lot of confidence. But if you do that, then you can surround yourself with people that compensate for your weaknesses. And that's why he did it, is that essentially he was looking for people that, you know, this is what I do well and this is what other people do well. And so then you, there's a healthy respect on the team. But that, it, it's just, it's, and, he, and he talks about the idea of pain and reflection and progress and all these things that there's 10 major points. But I, uh, in the book, Principles is really, I think, it, deals with this as far as an antidote maybe to uh, uh, imposter syndrome, although there are many books, I'm sure, on the case. But I, one that we've covered here, I think, really covers this well. Um, so we now have uh, 15 minutes left, and I will stop the recording here uh, unless there are any other comments. Uh, and then we'll go to the improv section uh, of the portion of the evening. Um, I know with 15 minutes, that maybe that's not uh, a lot. Uh, so, Mike, how, do, how would you like to approach yeah. this? Let me stop the recording first. Sure.